Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and then place a marker at John 4, verse 23. So Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, and John chapter 4, verse 23. We are in the third week of our series called This Is Us. This is us, and we're not talking about the TV show. We're talking about, actually, who we want to be as a church, who we long to be as a church, and who we are supposed to be as a church. The subtitle is The Five Keys to a Healthy Church. We're talking about the five purposes of the church that we find in two statements that were made by Jesus. I know many of you have heard this before, but each week I will remind you what those statements are. The first one is in Matthew chapter 22. It's a statement made by Jesus that we refer to as the great commandment. It's when they came up to Jesus and they asked him, what is the most important commandment? And he told them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said, the second one is just like it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's where we get some of the purposes. And then the second passage is Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It's a passage that we refer to as the Great Commission. And that is where Jesus told us to go into all the world, preaching the gospel, baptizing them, and teaching them everything that he has commanded us to do. So two weeks ago, we introduced this series, and we read those passages together, and we talked about why it is so important for a church to know what its purpose is, why it's important for a church to know why it exists. And we discussed the first of the five purposes. And then last week, we actually introduced a model for looking at the different purposes. Does anyone remember what that model is? It's the word, the what, the why, the whom, and the how. Okay? So the word, for example, and and I'll go through this again. In week one, our word was fellowship. The what of that is living life together. The why, as Randy so well knows, is because life is hard. The whom is the church body. We fellowship with one another, with each other. And the how, we talked about all of the different groups, all of the things that you saw in that commercial just a minute ago, the ladies group and the men's group and the young adults group and all of the things that we do to provide opportunities for you to build fellowship and build relationship. And then we reminded you that even though we provide all of those opportunities, it's your responsibility to get involved. In the second week, our word was ministry. The what was loving people. The why is because Jesus said so. The whom is your neighbor. And Jesus explained very clearly that our neighbor is anyone we come into contact with. Anyone and everyone who we come into contact with is our neighbor. And then the how, I told you, you tell me. I told you that we're going to provide lots of opportunities for you to get involved in ministry. We're going to have a recess program coming soon, which is a respite night for families with special needs children. We're going to be volunteering at the elementary school and at the daycare next door. We're going to be doing all sorts of things for you to get involved in ministry. But what I'm really excited about is when God lays a ministry on your heart and you come to me and say, hey, I really feel like that we're supposed to do this. And I get to tell you, awesome, that sounds good. As long as it doesn't cost any money, let's do it. And some things that do cost money will do as well. So now you're caught up with us even if you missed the first two weeks. And if you want more detail, you can go to our Centerpoint NWA YouTube channel and you can actually watch those two sermons. I encourage you to do that if you did miss those. But our primary text for the series is found in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Acts 2, 42 through 47. And what we find here is the New Testament church in its infancy. The brand new New Testament church doing what God told them to do, what Jesus told them to do. So as I did before, I'm going to read this passage, and I want you to look for these five keys, worship, ministry, fellowship, discipleship, and evangelism. It says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
Today we're going to talk about a purpose of the church that is encapsulated in just two little words at the beginning of verse 47. Two tiny words praising God. Today the word is worship. It's strange to me that this concept of worship wasn't giving, given any more attention than it was when we have this picture of the New Testament church. Because worship is a big deal. It's a big deal in the Bible. In fact, if you search the God's Word translation in the ESWORD program, what you will find is that the word worship has 486 uses in that translation of the Bible. 486 times the word worship was used. To put that into perspective, I think that's about 27 more times than the word love. That's a lot. So what is worship and, and why do we view it as one of the purposes of the church? To answer that question, I want to point you back to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. This is where Jesus is asked, what is the most important commandment? In other words, they came to him and said, what is the single most important thing that you could tell me that I need to do? And the very first thing that Jesus said is you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The most important thing, he says, is loving God. Loving God with every part of who you are. And worship is what happens when we do that. Worship is what takes place when we love God with every fiber of our being. Now let me tell you that lots of books have been written on the topic of worship. Lots of sermons have been preached on the topic of worship. Lots of blog posts and inspirational videos and cute little Etsy sayings have been created and uploaded on the topic of worship and what is worship. A lot of people have an opinion on worship. But I can't think of anyone better for us to look to when we try to de define worship than to look to Jesus. Amen? Specifically, I want us to look at a conversation that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman that we commonly refer to as the woman at the well. This is in John chapter 4, and I'm not going to read that entire story, but basically this woman comes to the well in the middle of the day, and Jesus is there. And he asks her for water, and she says, Sir, how am I supposed to get you water? You don't even have anything to drink with. And he says, Woman, if you knew what you're talking about, you would be asking me for living water. And he witnesses to this woman, and he actually tells her something about her life that makes her realize, I say realize, makes her think that he is a prophet. And we all know that he's much more than a prophet. But he has told this woman something about herself that makes her say, surely you are a prophet. And then as soon as she realizes that he is in her mind a prophet, she asks him the most burning question she has about religion. Just like we would do if we met the foremost expert on a subject we would ask them the question that we most had about that topic. So she says, well, you're surely a prophet, so, so tell me this. Our Samaritans' ancestors worshipped on this mountain, the mountain where they were standing. She said, but you Jews say that you have to worship in Jerusalem, so which is it? She says, prophet, tell me, which one is it? And Jesus tells her that a time is coming when the Father won't be worshipped on that mountain or in Jerusalem. He goes on in verses 23 and 24 to say this. Indeed, the time is coming, and it is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for people like that to worship him. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's amazing to me how much Jesus communicates in these two small verses. He communicates so much. 
Today, what I want to do to explain the what of worship is I actually want us to look at the what not. In other words, to explain what true worship is, I want us to look at what Jesus said true worship is not. The first thing, if you're taking notes, that Jesus said true worship is not, is it's not tied to a map. Now, there's lots of really nerdy stuff that I could get into and, and tell you about the Samaritans. There's lots of stuff I could tell you about their backstory. But it would take a lot of time, and it would probably bore you more than it excites me. So instead, I'm just going to summarize for you something. The Samaritans and the Jews did not like one another. And part of that reason was because of difference in religious beliefs. The Samaritans religiously followed the Mosaic law. They were descendants of the Israelites. They followed the law that Moses gave to the T. And the mountain that they lived near, they believed to be the mountain where Abraham had almost sacrificed his son Isaac. So they believed that mountain to be a special holy place. And they built a temple there, and they followed the sacrificial system where once a year they would come and they would bring their animals and they would sacrifice them to worship God and to ask for forgiveness of their sins. Just like the Jews did in Jerusalem, the Samaritans did here. They built a temple there and they followed the worship system. Now the Jewish people did not like this very much because they worshiped in Jerusalem at the temple that was built by Solomon. And the Jews believed that the only acceptable place for worship was the temple in Jerusalem that was built by Solomon. And by the way, at that time, the Jews were actually correct. The Samaritans were wrong. The, the ark of God did live and reside in the temple at Jerusalem. But Jesus knew what was about to happen. He said, the time is coming soon when you won't worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Because Jesus knew that he was preparing to lay down his life to become the ultimate human sacrifice to pay the price for our sins. And by doing so, he would fulfill the law and animal sacrifices would no longer be required. Jesus also knew that upon his death that the veil that separated the common man from the presence of God would be ripped top to bottom. And we would have direct access to the Father through the Son. Jesus knew these things. He probably also knew, or, he, or we know that he knew that the temple in Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and he probably also knew that the Samaritan people would soon be scattered and wouldn't have access to their temple. Jesus knew that because of the sacrifice that was about to take place, that worship would no longer be tied to a map. He said, the time is coming that you won't worship at either place. Now you can and should worship wherever you are. The sad thing is that even today, many people don't understand this. They think that worship is tied to a place. Many people think that worship is tied to the church. If you ask them where they worship, they say, oh, well, I go to Center Point Church. Or, oh, I go to First Assembly. Or, I go to First Baptist. They tie in their minds worship to a map. There are Christians everywhere that think that they have to be at church to worship God. But let me tell you where real worship happens. Real, true worship happens in your living room. It happens in your car. It happens at the grocery store. For some people, it even happens at Razorback games. Right, Lynn? Amen. I remember a few weeks ago, I dropped Justin off to take his ACT at the high school. And I don't remember why I dropped him off. I don't know if it was weather or if I needed his car. It's not something I do anymore because he drives himself. But as I dropped him off and I sat and I watched him walk into that building, I had that same feeling of 
joy and pride and fear that every parent who has ever dropped their child off at school and watched them walk into the building has felt. It's a feeling I hadn't had in a long time because he drives himself now. But as I watched my boy walk into the school and I felt those feelings, I I stopped myself and I pulled over to the side and, and just watched him walk in and I said, God, thank you so much for giving me Justin. Thank you for letting me be his parent. God, help me to be... Help me to parent him in a way that honors you. And then I went on and I, and I prayed for Justin to do well on his ACT and other things, but I sat there in my car and I worshiped God. True worship happens anywhere that you decide to get alone with God and honor him for who he is. The second thing that Jesus taught us about true worship is that it's not tied to a calendar. You see, they would go to the temple once a year for their time of worship. Once a year, they would go to worship God. It was on a calendar that they would do so. And there were many feasts and festivals where they would honor the things that God had done, and every one of those was based upon the calendar. No longer do we have to go to God on a set schedule to worship him. Just like we can worship God at any place, we can also worship him at any time. In fact, what we should do is worship him all the time. Do you guys remember when when Jesus said, we, we looked at it earlier, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind every Sunday between 11 and 12. I don't remember that. That's not the way that I read it. I don't remember him putting parameters around when we're supposed to love God. And I don't know about you, but if, if we're really going to worship God for all eternity, I think we should probably get used to doing it for more than 20 minutes. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a church service and see people get bored if worship goes for longer than what they're accustomed to. That's a travesty. Church, I want to encourage you to get in the habit of hanging out with God. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Now let me tell you how you can get into a habit of doing this. This is a really cool trick, and if you'll put it into place, it will change your life. Create worship triggers in your life. Create things in your life that trigger worship in your heart. Find things that you encounter on a daily basis and choose to worship whenever those things happen. For example, use red lights. Condition yourself that when you come up to a red light and you have to stop, worship God. Or use commercials. If you watch a lot of TV, use commercials. Whenever a commercial comes on, Commit yourself to worship God during the commercials. Use school buses. Every time you pass a school bus or a Volkswagen bug or a Hummer or a Porsche or whatever will catch your attention and remind you, worship God when you see that happen. Create worship triggers. And what you will find soon is that you get so used to doing that that you will begin worshiping God all of the time. You'll get to a stoplight that didn't turn red, but that you thought was going to, and you'll worship him. Create worship triggers. Train yourself to worship God all the time. True worship is not tied to a map or a calendar. It's also not tied to an activity. Look out, preacher. 
Worship means singing a song, playing music, and lifting our hands, right? Guys, that's not it. That's not what worship's about. Now, I love our worship team. Absolutely love them. In fact, right now, stop. We don't do this enough. Let's give a hand to our worship team. Can we do that? Can you, do you guys see this guitar up here? Did you notice this? Ben, that guitar is awesome. Like, and, and you guys don't know this because he's playing in church, but that dude can play some mean music. I mean, he is good. I love our worship team, and I'm thankful for every single one of them. But I don't need them to worship. And let me tell you this. I can sing a song. I can play an instrument, the drums. And I can lift my hands without ever worshiping God one time. And so can some of you. I've seen you do it. But I can worship God without playing one note Singing one note. I can worship God without being in a church and without music. I can worship God anywhere, anytime. I told you that I've sat in church services and watched people who get bored after a certain amount of time when they're worshiping God. Well, what's even worse than that, and you see it a lot in youth ministry, is when the music stops, the worship stops. It's like the music is a gas pedal for their worship. Oh, song's playing, here we go. Oh, song stop, here we go. I lost my place. <laughs> it's what happens when you get off the notes and... I can worship God without music and you should be able to as well. Jesus says that true worshipers Worship him in spirit and in truth, not in body and in action. Worship comes from the inside. Worship comes from the heart. And I'll be honest with you too, like, like I love worship services, I really, really do, but because of my vocation, I worship better by myself in my room or in my car than I do in a church service. Because when I come in here on Sunday mornings and the worship, the corporate worship experience is taking place, which is important, by the way. I'm not saying it's not. But when I come in and that experience is taking place, I'm thinking about, okay, what am I getting ready to say when I get up there? Okay, is it too hot in here? Is it too cold in here? Are the lights too bright? Are the lights too dim? Is it too loud? Is it too quiet? I've got so many things going through my mind that I struggle to worship in here in the corporate worship service. That's why usually, for some of you may have noticed, usually I don't come in here until the last song. And the reason why is because I am somewhere in this building by myself worshiping God and getting my mind right. Worship is not tied to an activity. Worship is tied to a state of being. So the what of worship is just exalting God. You guys know we have an L word for everything. For us, it's lift the Lord. Worship the what is lifting the Lord. Why? Because of who he is. Can we just stop and think for a minute about who God is? I mean, Christina read the scripture from Psalms this morning. Would it say his, his greatness is unfathomable? He's so great that we can't even fathom how great he is. Church, we serve an awesome God. And he loves us more than we could ever imagine. And he is greater than any person or anything that has ever lived. Jesus told us that the most important thing that we can do is love the Lord our God. With all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. But that's not why I worship him. 
I worship him because of who he is. I worship him because he's a God that cares about me and that loves me and is powerful enough to create this entire world but caring enough to take time out and minister directly to this one person. I want to be clear about something too that some people think that we worship God for what he's done. Guys, that's praise. We praise God for what he's done, and that's important as well. But we don't worship God for what he's done. We worship him for who he is. And he could never do another thing for you the rest of your life, and he would still be worthy of your worship. The reason that's so important to know that distinction is because sometimes life gets really tough. Sometimes we go through trials and we go through struggles and we go through things that aren't very fun and it's hard to see God working in those situations. So it's sometimes hard to praise God in those situations. But it should never be hard to worship God because he never changes. And he's always worthy. It's not about what have you done for me lately, God. You see, for this particular purpose of the church, the why and the whom are closely tied together. The why we worship is because he's God, because of who he is. The whom is God. Now, now that's obvious. Whom do we worship? We worship God. But this passage that, where Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, it actually illustrates it even further than just saying God. It says that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It tells us that we are to worship God, the spirit. What that means is that we are to worship him in his divinity. He is a divine God. He's not bound to a time or a place. He's everywhere all the time. And he's all powerful. He's able to do anything that he wants to do. He's a God that we don't know with our senses, such as sight and sound. He's a God that we know with our spirits. We feel him and we know him. He is a God that is everywhere present, everywhere conscious, and everywhere acting on our behalf. He's a God that we can know, but we can never fully understand. He's a God who we can receive, but we can never fully deserve. But the cool thing about it is this, and Jesus made this clear when he was talking to the Samaritan woman. Even though this God, whom is the object of our worship, is an all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present being, he's not only an all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present being. See, Jesus says the time is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Guys, he's not just a spirit God. He is our heavenly Father. Jesus makes a point to remind the Samaritan woman that the God he's talking about, the God who she worships, is the loving Father. He's not distant and unapproachable. He's near to us. And just like any other good father, he cares for us, he provides for us, and he teaches us. The whom of our worship is God our Father. And the how. Well, just like last week, 
This is another one that sits squarely on your shoulders. How will you worship God? Because yes, as a church, we will provide a time for corporate worship in our services. In fact, we'll have some services that are solely dedicated to worshiping together. But if that's the only place that you worship God and the only time that you worship God, then you are sorely missing what worship is. How you worship is going to be your responsibility. And it's going to be based on your personality. I'll tell you, one of my favorite ways to worship, I haven't got to do it in a long time because I sold my bike. One of my favorite ways to worship was to put in some earbuds with some worship music, climb on my motorcycle, and head to Washington County and hit those curves. I love it. Just getting out there and, and just me and God and nobody else and the wind in my face and, the, and flying by. I mean, I love it. That's, that's one of my favorite ways to worship. I worship God in other ways. I worship God by cleaning the church. Every week, Christina and I come in. Usually on Saturday, we clean the church to get it ready for everyone to come in. And, and as I do that, I'm worshiping him. I'm laying these clipboards down on every row and I'm straightening the chairs and making sure they're straight and I'm saying God please touch somebody tomorrow Re reach people tomorrow with the message that you want them to hear I worship God by cleaning the church sometimes I worship God just by laying in my bed no music, no, no TV, no nothing I just lay there in bed and I think about how awesome he is and I just tell him and I don't I don't, I mean, you guys know me. I don't use these and thous and dear heavenly father, how great thou art. I'm laying there in bed and I'm like, God, you're so awesome. Man, I love you. Man, thank you so much for, for loving me. Thank you for bringing me out of a life of sin into this life that you've given me now. And I just lay there and talk to God. I also worship God in my giving. You guys think I just say that. You think I get up here and say we're going to move from one area of worship into another. That I really feel that way. Now you guys see, I don't, I don't put money in the bucket because I do it online. But every time I sit down and set up the online payment for my tithes, I do so as an act of worship. And I say, God, use this. However you see fit, use this. The truth is you can worship God in lots of different ways because worship is not about what's happening on the outside. Worship is about what's going on on the inside. Worship is about what you are feeling on the inside.